Um, I'm so excited to be here. We have a really fun night planned for you guys. Two very talented writers, Diksha Basu and Cheryl Lulian Tan, um, will be reading from and discussing their sharp, hilarious new novels about social climbing, class striving, um, status symbols, new money, love, ambition, materialism. I don't know about you guys, but personally, it's one of my favorite things. Um, Diksha Basu's debut novel, The Windfall, follows the rise of a middle-class Delhi family after they hit the internet jackpot and come into an unexpected $20 million and their increasingly absurd quest to keep up with the Joneses, or in this case, the Chopras, after they move to the super rich side of town. Kevin Kwan, author of Crazy Rich Asians, said he almost fell out of bed laughing reading the book Sharply Observed Satire, so you know it's good. Meanwhile, Cheryl Lulian Tan's novel, Sarang Party Girls, described as Jane Austen in Singlish, or Singaporean English, stars Jazzy, a spunky, sharp, materialistic young woman in Singapore's party scene, who, along with two of her best friends, um, is on the hunt to snag a rich white husband, and then the ultimate status symbol, a half-white Chanel baby, as she calls it. So first up, we have Diksha reading from The Windfall. She is a writer and occasional actor. Originally from New Delhi, she holds a BA in economics from Cornell University and an MFA in creative writing from Columbia University. Her writing has appeared in The New York Times, Cosmopolitan, BuzzFeed, BBC, The Guardian, and much more. Some fun facts about her. So, The Windfall has actually been optioned for television by Paramount TV and Anonymous Content and is currently in development. Um, she wants you to know that she got a little drunk and got her first tattoo last week. <laughs> she also had a baby three months ago, so congratulations. Also on the tattoo. Um, now please welcome Diksha Basu. I will offer stories about the tattoo to anyone who sticks around afterwards. <laughs> so I'm going to read a little bit from The Windfall. Um, don't follow along because I find I often edit as I read, which is horrifying to do in an actually published book because there's no going back at this point. So just close books if you have them and listen along. <laughs> Mr. Dinesh Chopra from Block C, Sector 12A of the Delhi suburb of Gurgaon was not afraid of much. He could count on one hand the number of things that frightened him. Stray dogs, rusted edges on cans, bearded men on airplanes, and young women in two-piece bathing suits. But the thing that frightened him the most was poverty. And he understood far too well that poverty, like all tragedy, was largely relative, and the Mukherjee's next door had recently sold their house in Gurgaon and moved to London. Not Hounslow either, Kensington. This had been particularly humiliating for Mr. Chopra because he had spent a considerable amount of money and two months having the dome of the Sistine Chapel recreated on the ceiling of his foyer. It's a small investment, he told Mr. Mukherjee one afternoon, but I'm such a big fan of art. I'd be happy to give you the number for the painters. They can recreate anything, even Bollywood posters. Well, I'm sure it'll turn out beautifully. I just don't think it's worth spending so much right now, Mr. Mukherjee replied. Hmm, it is quite an indulgence. Yes, Mr. Chopra said. This market has spared no one, but one must spoil oneself. At the time, he walked away feeling smug about his wealth, but looking back at it, now that the Mukherjees had sold their house and disappeared to London, Kensington, he felt humiliated and nervous. If the Mukherjees had managed to make the move to London, that too without telling the whole neighborhood about it, they were clearly making a significant amount of money. That meant that relative to the Mukherjees, the Chopras were becoming poor. And not just relative to the Mukherjees, relative also to the family that had bought the Mukherjee's house. Mr. Chopra knew that house was not cheap. It was a bungalow with front and backyards. The driveway was comfortably 15 yards long, and the Mukherjees had planted trees so carefully along the fence around the perimeter that you couldn't see any of the barbed wire that ran above the fence. So thick was the greenery that over the last five years, two thieves had injured themselves on the barbed wire while trying to climb into the Mukherjee's property. 
Not a single thief had tried coming into the Chopra's property. It was worrying. To experiment, Mr. Chopra had the glass shards that lined the top of his fence removed one day. He then sat in his yard at night and monitored those sections waiting for a thief to intrude. None did. A lone monkey climbed through around 11 p.m., which caused Mr. Chopra to go rushing back into the house and have the glass shards put back in place immediately the next day. The Chopras were stagnant. The other piece of residential property they owned was a bungalow in Goa with only three floors that wasn't even close enough to the beach for them to be able to rent it out to white travelers at a good markup. And the down payment they had made on a Dubai flat was being held up because the builders were under scrutiny for violating local building regulations. Why aren't you working? Mrs. Chopra asked her husband's back from the sofa. He was standing and gazing out of the window into the front yard. And where is Johnny? I haven't seen him all day. I don't think he came home last night, Mr. Chopra said, laughing a little. His son, at age 28, still showed no ambition or signs of having a real career. Mr. Chopra supported him financially, and everyone knew that. Johnny went to all the best restaurants in town, regularly traveled abroad with his friends, and wore flashy designer jeans. And Mr. Chopra paid for everything, which made it clear that Mr. Chopra earned enough not just for himself and his wife, but also for his son to live a lavish lifestyle. Clearly, he was earning the equivalent of at least three high incomes. He often wished they'd had another child, but really only so everyone at the club would know that he was earning enough for four. Shashi Junjunwala, who had made his money exporting slightly subpar medical supplies to hospitals in the Middle East, had four children, all of whom drove BMWs and none of whom had ever held a job. Mr. Chopra continued to stare out of the window. The bushes need to be tended. You can't even tell the one on the left is supposed to be a swan, he said. Don't give the gardener's wife any more old saris until the bush looks perfectly like a swan. And I think it may be time to install a swimming pool. Mm, everything grows too fast this time of year, Mrs. Chopra said. The house is fine for now. Only thing I do want to get is the Mona Lisa Bollywood style with the bindi on her forehead painted on the wall in the master bathroom. <laughs> Why are you standing and staring out of the window? Mr. Chopra turned around to face his wife. She was sitting cross-legged in her nightgown on the large, white, L-shaped leather sofa that went along the wall of the living room. In front of her, a wooden box sat open with her jewelry spilling out. A gold bangle had fallen on the carpet in front of her. Not many homes in Delhi had full carpeting, but theirs did. On the low glass coffee table, Mrs. Chopra's iPad was open with the current Bollywood hits playing with a tinny sound. Mrs. Chopra, originally Miss Kanna, came from wealth. She came from a family of farm owners in Ferozpur, and she didn't have the same relationship with money that he did. Since before independence, her family had endless acres of farms. Her brothers were all politicians in Ferozpur with mistresses in Chandigarh. When the British army showed up in their village on the morning of August 14, 1947, to draw a border and create India and Pakistan, the Khannas on the other side of the border merely got up, walked across to the Indian side, and immediately started working on claiming new land to make up for what they had lost to the other side. They didn't complain about the British, and how could they? Before independence, most of their closest friends were British, and Mrs. Chopra's parents firmly believed Indian independence was to be a temporary misfortune. They died waiting for the British to come back. They didn't dramatize the separation of the countries, and they didn't worry about the massacre that followed. They were very aware of what they could and could not control, so they quietly set about recreating whatever they had lost through whatever means needed. And this was the attitude with which Mrs. Chopra lived every day. Mr. Chopra's parents, on the other hand, made their money in the construction business in Chandigarh after independence, and it didn't come easily. There were financial ups, and there were downs, and more downs, and it took quite a while for it to become largely ups. They gained membership to the local club, and then lost it because of an inability to pay the annual dues. They then managed to get in again, but it was never quite the same. He was aware of what his parents had been through, and that always made him nervous about his own money, even though his father had bought him the mica mine when he was 18, and he had never actually experienced any difficulty. His older brother, Upin, had never been afraid. He had taken over their parents' construction business right in Chandigarh and never cared much about money. He was more interested in trying to convert people to using solar power than making money for himself, and that was probably why his wife had an affair and eventually left him to move to Hong Kong with a hedge fund manager. 
Not that Upen's life seemed to have been destroyed by any of this. He looked fitter and younger than Mr. Chopra, even though at 63 he was four years older. What, he wondered, was the secret of his brother's youth? He didn't even eat meat. Mr. Chopra himself had worked extremely hard in the beginning, and it paid off. Now he only went to the mine two or three days a month, and he usually chartered a helicopter to get there. The mine was in the Bilwara district in Rajasthan, which was close enough to do in a day, but far enough to justify spending a night if he needed a night away from his wife's nagging. The rest of the time, he, needed, he did the minimal work required to manage the mine from his home office. Mr. Chopra made his way down the driveway towards the gate. He saw Balwinder, the security guard, snoozing. Balwinder, do we pay you so much just to sleep all day? He said, get up, get up, and how many times have I told you to wear your hat even if we are not expecting visitors? Balwinder lazily picked up his hat, brushed off the dust, and placed it on his head. He liked working for the Chopras. There was hardly anything for him to do. On days when Mrs. Mr. Chopra went to Bilwara, he opened the gate once in the morning to let Mr. Chopra's Jaguar out, and once in the evening to let Mr. Chopra's Jaguar back in. Other than that, he only had to open the gate a few times a week to let Mrs. Chopra's BMW in and out as she headed to the mall or her ladies' lunch parties. The Chopras were good employers. They made him sleep out near the gate only on nights when they were having parties. Other than that, he went to his quarter at the back at 10 p.m., and anybody who needed to be let in or out buzzed the bell at the gate that rang in his room. The only one who went in or out after 10 p.m. was Johnny, and Johnny always had pretty young girls in flimsy clothing with him. Just last Sunday, Balwinder had seen Johnny and a girl stumble out of a taxi and down the driveway. About halfway there, Johnny had pushed the girl against the compound wall and slipped his hand down the front of her tight jeans. The girl tilted her head back and moaned, and the image kept Balwinder warm through the night. Mr. Chopra peered over the gate and saw Mrs. Cha step out of a taxi. Sir, would you like me to open the gate or call for the car, Balwinder said. Mr. Chopra ducked down and said through clenched teeth, be quiet, you good for nothing. I'm trying to see the new neighbors and put your hat on properly. Mr. Chopra waited a few seconds and then went back on his toes to look through the protective barbed wire on the top of the gate. It was a regular black and yellow taxi, not air conditioned. The woman inside was wearing a simple pale pink sari heavily starched with a dark pink blouse, and Mr. Chopra's first thought was that the neighbors had fancier maids than he did. Perhaps it was time to put his staff in uniforms. Mrs. Cha could feel sweat dripping along her spine and wished she had opted for a lighter cotton sari. She didn't want to give in to the pressure of this neighborhood, yet she had worn one of her nicer handloom saris today. But the houses here were so spaced apart that it was unlikely that she would even encounter anyone. The only sign she had seen of people on this road was a passing blue Aston Martin with such darkly tinted windows there was no way of knowing if there was a dog driving the car. A year ago, she wouldn't even have known what an Aston Martin was. Suddenly, Mrs. Cha heard voices. She looked up toward the closed gate to her right just in time to see a balding head vanish from above the gate. Thank you. Let's give it up again for Diksha Basu and her hilarious book. <laughs> Next up, we have uh, Cheryl Lulian Tan. Um, she is a New York based journalist and author of the new novel, Sarong Party Girls, which was named one of Amazon's 10 best books of the month for July of 2016. A native of Singapore, she also wrote A Tiger in the Kitchen, a memoir of food and family and was editor of the fiction anthology, Singapore Noir. She was a staff writer at the Wall Street Journal, InStyle Magazine, and the Baltimore Sun. Her stories have also appeared in the New York Times and the Paris Review, among other places. She has been the recipient of several grants from the National Arts Council of Singapore in support of her books. And her fun fact is that she is the only person she knows who doesn't know how to ride a bike. So don't you ever tell her it's just like riding a bicycle. Please welcome Cheryl Lulian Tan. Hi. Um, thanks for coming. Can you hear me? Um, 
So a few things about this book. Um, Sarong Party Girls is an actual term in Singapore that um, I was always I, I was always very cognizant of when I was growing up. Um, it refers to a type of woman in Singapore um, whose main goal in life is to meet a white guy and date him and preferably marry him. Um, and when I was growing up, it was you know I was always very curious about these women. Like why would they choose people based on race um, or just some status symbol? Um, but I realized the more I thought about it, um, it sort of dated back to our colonial roots because uh, the story goes that the British soldiers used to have parties and they would invite uh, the local girls and they would be wearing sarongs, so sarong party girls. Um, but when I was growing up, it was actually a very bad term. You didn't want to be a sarong party girl. Um, but when I went back to Singapore to research Tiger, uh, and I reconnected with all my primary school friends, and they had done the traditional thing of getting married to good Singaporean boys, gotten divorced terribly in their 30s, um, and then all of a sudden we're back on the market, and they were like, you know what, we're SPGs now. Like, <laughs> so it was sort of like this modern SPG uh, who's like tr rejecting the traditional stereotype and going, we've done the traditional Singaporean thing, it's patriarchal, we're gonna do our own thing. So um, one night when I was with one of my friends, um, and she was dating this British guy, um, and she said, well, you know, the main goal in life is to have, the main goal is to have a Chanel baby, right? I'm like, what's that? And she's like, you know, a half white, half Singaporean baby. It's the Chanel of babies. So when she said that, I was like, okay, well, that says just, that says a lot about Singapore, materialism, culture, et cetera. I've got to write this book. So, um, and now actually Dahlia actually did end up marrying that British guy and she has two Chanel babies. Um, <laughs> um, I'm just gonna read from the beginning of the book. Um, the protagonist, Jazzy, is 26, turning 27, and in a panic. Uh, the book is written in Singlish, uh, which uh, is a mix of Chinese, Malay, English. Um, we say la a lot in Singapore. It's used for, as an accent. Um, and um, a few things like angmo means white. Um, and we, Singaporeans use the word cock in a different way than people here. Um, we use it to say like it's a really screwed up thing or you know, or if you're sitting around shooting the breeze with someone, you're talking cock with them. So it's not, when I, when I say the word cock, it's not quite what it is in New York. Ayo, I tell you. If we do nothing, we are confirmed getting into bang balls territory. We have to figure out how to make this happen, and we have to do it now. After all, we've wasted enough time already, and we don't have any more time to waste. We are not young anymore, you know. Fan just turned 27, my 27th birthday is two months away, and Emos is not far behind. If we don't get married, engaged, or even nail down a boyfriend soon, my god, we might as well go ahead and book a room at Singapore Casket, because our lives will already be over. In many ways, in Singapore, our kind of age is already considered a bit left on the shelf. Ordinarily, I don't really heck care about such things. Hello, Jazzy here knows she's quite power. Usually, unless the guy is blind or stupid or some shit, whatever guy I have my eye on, I can also get, even at my age. You ask any bookie out there, my odds are damn good. But it's true that Singaporean men are a bit fussy, especially when it comes to older girls. But luckily for us, we still have one big hope. Ang more guys. That's what we need to be thinking about. These white guys, they really catch no ball about Asian ages. Us 20-something-year-old Asian girls, if you wear a tight, tight dress or short, short skirt, these angmas will still steam over you. Some of them even go for the really old ones. 30-year-old women also have chance. <laughs> even so, we cannot waste time. We must be serious, because once you manage to marry a white guy, then you are only one step away from the number one champion status symbol in Singapore, a half angmo kid, the Chanel of babies. But how to get an angmo husband? I used to think getting an angmo husband was quite easy to do. I mean, hello, we girls are always out there, meeting angmos, letting them buy drinks for us, dance dance, rubber rubber a bit. So surely one day we'll just naturally end up with an angmo husband, right? At least that was the thinking law. Recently though, I realized something that started making me nervous about achieving our goal. And it only hit me on that super cock night, the one where we lost Sher. I tell you, I cannot even talk about that night right now without vomiting blood. Sher is so pretty, so sweet, so thin, has such fair skin, she could have had any guy she wanted. After that night, I realized that yes, we've been quite focused over the years. If you count up all the guys in our group has dated since secondary school, most of them are angmos, not always good quality ones. Some of them, I have to admit, are the don't wear suits to work type. But still, in this small country, to be able to say that most of our boyfriends and flings have come from England or some shit is quite good luck. Most girls here end up with local boyfriends the whole time. What nonsense. I tell you, if a bus runs me over on the streets tomorrow, Jazzy here will go up there with no regrets. Once we lost her, though, I realized that our angmo husband's strategy was not so good because we had no strategy. You ask Sun Tzu or Lee Kuan Yew, they confirm will say that every important thing also must have strategy. 
So first things first, must call a meeting. After work, Walla Walla Bar at Holland Village. Of the four of us, there were only three left, me, Fan, and Emo. Time to get serious. Once the girls sat down, I said, listen, I've been thinking, we don't have much time. Look at us three, this is a happening Thursday night, and the best plans we have are going out with each other. No husband, no two carat diamond ring, not even a boyfriend. What kind of cock life is this? If we want to marry Ang Mo guys, we cannot go to SPG bars and just anyhow shoot arrow. No wonder we haven't win yet. We must have a method. Emo looks skeptical. If we just go to Chaplin's or Hard Rock, aren't we just doing it because it's fun? Fun your head lah, I said. Like that, maybe for one night or a few nights, of course it will work. But if we want to get married, then we must be more strategy. So listen, I came up with this idea. It has four parts. <laughs> Which is very Singaporean, by the way. <laughs> Emo leaned forward. I could tell she was a little curious. Of all of us, she's the one who's most focused on getting married. Her father, ayo, oh my god. When we were in secondary school, we didn't see Emo's dad very much. Uncle was always traveling for work. Each week, he would disappear for a few nights, often over the weekend. So every time we were at her house, it was mostly just us hanging out with auntie. Auntie never seemed to mind, though. Whenever uncle came back from his travels, he always brought something nice. Sometimes got duty-free perfume la. Other times, if he disappeared for longer trips, he would actually come back with a Prada handbag, that kind of thing. Uncle was so boring, we didn't think about him at all. He was like my dad, or Fan's dad, who we didn't really care about until he suddenly had a heart attack. But then right after we graduated from JC, <laughs> uncle and auntie sat Emo down after dinner and said, we have something to tell you. Emo said everything happened very quickly once uncle started talking. Everything also just anyhow come out. Apparently his job is not a traveling type of job. He works in a local insurance office. First he said, Imogen, you know your mommy and I love you very much, right? Everything you want, we also give you. When Emo first heard this, at first she thought he was dying. At the time, Fan's dad had just passed away, so we were all quite scared, wondering which uncle is the next to go. So Emo just nodded and kept quiet. But then uncle said, now that you're old enough, almost a woman already, your mommy and I thought that you should know something. You have two brothers. At first, Emo was quite confused. She didn't know what he meant. But how could my mom have two other kids that I don't know about? Cannot be. She had me when she was so young, and then I don't remember her being pregnant anymore. Where I got two sons? She was still thinking hard about all this when Uncle continued talking. I have another family, he said. Emo looked across the dinner table at her mom, who was looking a bit blank-faced, except that her eyes were staring down. She said Auntie was blinking and looking hard at her fingers, which were pulling apart at one corner of the carefully ironed white tablecloth that she had spent four months last year crocheting. This was the tablecloth that Auntie cared about so much that she even bought a special clear plastic cover for it for Chinese New Year. So when people brought curry or whatever over, her tablecloth will still be number one okay. So Emo knew that if her mom was actually cho with this tablecloth, then confirm, this conversation is really serious. Uncle continued, when I met your mom, I already had one son, and then just around the time that you were born, I had my second son. They look a bit like you, actually. Emo is usually quite tut la. So at this point, when she told all of us about it, we thought the situation was quite clear. But Emo was actually still confused. So she asked her dad, but you had your mistress before mom? She still wasn't getting anything or understanding what was going on. When she told me, sure, and fan all this, my god, we all just wanted to reach over and slap her one time. Where I got people so stupid? That was when uncle looked a little bit embarrassed. And she said her mom by this time couldn't even look up from the tablecloth. Emo, I care about your mom very much, and I care about you very much. The two sons I have are with my wife. They live here in, well, a town center quite far from here, so you were definitely never in the same schools, of course. But now that you're all grown up, have wings, can fly already, we want you to know that you have brothers out there. Just keep that in mind whenever you meet new people. You just, uh, you just never know. Now that you're going, getting older, going out and dating, dating all, scarly, something weird happens, better be safe. So if you have any news about guys you're meeting, getting serious with you, just be sure to keep us informed, okay? Come, come, let's eat some oranges. <laughs> then after that, Emo's mom just got up, peeled two oranges for them, went to her room and turned on the TV and they didn't talk about it anymore. Wallow eh, crazy la. When Emo told us, at first we, quite much, we weren't quite sure what to say or think. We all hugged her and then we just looked at each other. Finally, she smiled, reached over and squeezed Emo's hand and said, eh, hey, Emo, you're lucky you're a sarong party girl. Like that, you confirm won't end up snogging your brother by mistake. <laughs> so, so ever since then, Emo has been quite determined. Get an Angmo husband or bus man. 
Come, set, tell us your strategy, she said. The kunyang had even closed her mirror and put it away, so I knew she was really listening. Number one, I said, looks. Obviously, we are quite chill. Otherwise, how come we have so many Angor guys always chasing us? But girls, think about it. If you look carefully, the types of Singaporean girls that Angor guys like to pop and the types that they end up marrying is quite different. So we must make ourselves look like the girls that they want to marry. But who, Imo asked. Ayo, I tell you. I pulled out some of the pictures I looked up on the phone this morning. Best one, Maggie Chong. This one, uh, I said, very power. Marry the best type of guy. European, French some more. Sexy, sexy one. Rich also. Imo and Fan were nodding. You see, uh, Maggie Chong, actually, her features are not so pretty. Her teeth are so big, got gaps some more. Her eyes are so small, cheeks a bit fat. But still, Angor guys love her. Because you know why? She's quite mysterious. Joan Chen, also same thing. Her face flat flat, also Angmo guys will still steam. So we must learn, better to be mysterious a bit. When we meet a po new possibility, cannot same night everything also whack. Number two is behaviour. You see, uh, Angmo's in Asia, step one for them is to look for girls to pop. This one is not hard. Lah. SPG bars, office, everywhere in this country, it's easy for them to find girls. But once they're used to this, it's quite difficult to get them to think differently. So the best thing is to grab them FOB. If you snatch the ones who just moved here one or two weeks ago, then confirm is a win. <laughs> but if you don't manage to do that, when you meet them, you must act quite differently from those girls who just want to give them one, two nights good time type. Until now, we've been good at the laugh, laugh, drink, drink, wink, wink type of thing. But if we want to be more serious, we must know what kinds of things that Angmo guys like. Football, rugby, maybe things like rowing or tennis are also quite good. We don't know much, also must learn, so every day we better read the Straits Times. English League, Italian League, German players, World Cup, everything also must know. If we know more, then we have more chance to talk more cock. If we talk more cock, then it becomes more like a relationship. Not just one night, gotta bing, gotta boom, then everything is over already. If they think that we like what they like, then an actual relationship more likely is can. What about them learning about the things that we like, Imo asked. I tell you, sometimes Imo's duteness is just really number one. Hello, I said, if you're waiting for a guy who wants to hold your hand and have long conversations about the new Shiseido eyeshadow, then you'd better take off your shoes and sit down comfortably because you are going to wait forever. Next, I said, we must understand the enemy. We cannot be like Jackie Chan in those Kung Fu movies. In the beginning, he's always the gundu. Everything also don't know. Don't understand that alama, suddenly his balls get whacked. No, if we want to win, then we must know who we are fighting. Number one, China girls. Since they come from China and are desperate not to go back, they anything will also do. No standards. Old, old, ugly, ugly, smelly, smelly, also they don't care. And because they are so willing and so pretend sweet, Angmo's really like them. Next, Filipinas. This one is quite dangerous because they are very Angmo already. It's very easy for them to talk to Angmo guys. They have a lot in common. Some more they sing really well, so if we see them in a karaoke lounge, I think we'd better just leave. No chance there. <laughs> better don't fight. Number three, other SPGs. This one is quite easy to spot in a bar, lah. but girls, we are all on the same side, all looking for the same thing. So please, if we see them, just show respect. No need to fight unless they try to potong your catch. But if they potong, then we hantam them one time. <laughs> Last one, this one is not hard. We should just know the places to go. We know the bars, Hard Rock, Studemeyer's, Chaplains. These are good places to spot Angmors. But we must also try and see them in normal situations. For example, Angmors really like brunch. I'm not talking about going to eat roti prata or prawn noodles type of brunch. Pancakes, la, eggs, la, that kind of thing. Even if we don't really like to eat that crap, we must also whack brunch. We cannot just whack the bars and clubs. Sunday lunchtime, must try. Okay, now we have to be serious a bit. If this is what we want, we must really understand all of this. Cannot anyhow, anyhow, anymore. The two of them were very quiet and looked at each other blankly. Jazzy Fan finally said, I think this plan, we cannot be like that. La. Love and relationships must be natural. Not so calculative. We cannot plan, plan, plan until like this. Otherwise, what does it all mean? We might as well be like our parents. My God, when she said this, this got me really upset. The whole point of my plan, of us trying so hard on all this, is exactly so we won't end up like our parents. Fan of all people should know, when her father dropped dead, her mother was actually happy. No one to cow bay and fight with her for the TV when she wants to watch her Cantonese serials anymore. No one to sit on her sofa smoking and peeling dried skin off his toes for hours each evening. Finally, after all those lousy years, peace inside her own house. Fan, I said, blinking hard at her. You wake up your own head. If we don't follow this plan, we will end up like your parents, my parents, or even worse, Emo's parents. It's true, Emo said very softly. We can't end up like them. 
In fact, I said, we have, we have to hurry up a bit. If you are serious about this, then come, let's set a deadline. Today is Feb 1st. By the end of the month, let's try and confirm something. Like what? Fan asks, you want us to be married in a month? Be engaged? Crazy law. Oh my god, these people. Look, I said, no one is asking you to hold a wedding banquet in 30 days. All I'm saying is, by the end of the month, we should at least have an Angmo boyfriend, a serious one. If we really focus and put our minds to it and follow the strategy, this one, I tell you, is probably Ken. So, how? Set? Emo looked at Fan, who looked back at her for a moment. Okay, Emo said, raising her glass and waving her hand at Fan to follow. Together, we clinked our glasses and said, set. Thank you. Let's give it up for Cheryl. We're going to start um, the Q&A section. So to start off, can you each talk a little bit more about your book for those in the audience who may not have read it? And I know Cheryl, you already went into this a little bit, but um, also tell us what inspired you to write it. Oh, sure. Uh, my book is mostly about new money in New Delhi. I grew up in India, in New Delhi in the 1990s, soon after the economy had opened up and there was this massive explosion of wealth all around that was extremely evident and very visible and hard to ignore. So in my story, there's the middle-aged, middle-class couple, Mr. and Mrs. Cha, who come into a sudden windfall of money and decide to make the move across the city and across class borders to the posh suburb of Gurgaon and the sort of mini mansions that populate that neighborhood. Um, and well, my book is um, sort of inspired by just sort of witnessing a lot of things around me. And um, I've always questioned the motives of Sarong Party Girls that I saw. Um, and um, so I wanted to sort of explore sort of modern feminism through this lens of, uh, in Singapore, through this lens of, you know, choice of husband, et cetera, and why would you choose one over the other, um, and, and how loaded, like, some of these factors can be, um, so. So obviously, uh, materialism factors a lot in both of your books. So I wanted to ask, what does success look like in modern India or modern Singapore? And can you speak on how that might butt heads with cultural traditions there? If I could answer that question here tonight, I re every anthropologist, economist, sociologist in India could retire. <laughs> so I don't want to do that. I don't think I'm capable of doing that. For me, what uh, fiction achieves, hopefully, is looking through a very, very narrow lens at a very specific topic, and that's what I set out to do here. Uh, I think the definition of wealth in India and success in India varies greatly, like it does in any country, in any part of the world. Um, it's often relative, that's why we live in this world of social media, it's more about looking over your shoulder to see what the person next to you is doing, and that's how it's often measured. Beyond that, on a whole national scale, I have absolutely no idea. I think it just completely varies. In my book, it's this very specific setting and these very specific characters who are navigating their way through wealth. But for me, one of the interesting things was I often wonder what I would want if I had no idea what anybody else wanted. And I don't know. And I don't think it very realistically most people know. Although a lot of people will pretend to and be very holier than thou and say they want very little. But I don't think it's as simple as that. I think it's a very hard question to grapple with. Um, well, Singapore is a very small country. You can pretty much drive from one end of the country to the other in an hour. Um, and, but it's, you know, we, our population is, I think there's someone from the consulate here, so I bet. <laughs> um, I, I think it's under six million, it's five point something right now. Um, and so you, it's a very rich country. Um, it's always listed on one of these places uh, as one of the most expensive places to live in the world. Um, and there's so much wealth there. A few years ago, there was a cocktail bar that has a $26,000 cocktail. Uh, it comes with a diamond in it. Um, so be careful, don't swallow it. Um, or yeah, anyway, yeah, anyway let's not go there. <laughs> but, um, but, um, 
so you have a small country where you have immense wealth and you have middle class and you have you know, people of all strata and they all tend to sort of collide with each other because it's such a small, densely populated place, um, which is what makes Singapore very fascinating to me because you know, when you have these people bumping and colliding to each other, um, you know, great stories happen. And um, I explore that a little bit because Jazzy and her friends are not of that, you know, they're not at that level, but they want to be. And so they're trying to figure out how they can get there. What's the ticket to get there? And I will say one of the things in India that is a mark of success is making enough money to move to Singapore. <laughs> um, so how did you go about doing the research for your book? Um, there's so much name dropping, of course, of brands, of you know, the right places to live, the neighborhoods. Um, how did you go about with the research? Being from Delhi, it's really as simple as that. I'm not a research heavy writer. I eavesdrop a lot. And I spend a lot of time in Delhi still. My family home is there, and so I go back, and that is my base. And really just obsessively observing people and being obsessed with conversations and dialogue and listening to what people next to me are saying. Uh, it's not a research-heavy book. It's, it, there's, uh, the brands and the places that you mentioned are all through things that I've actually lived and experienced. Uh, it's the same for me. My whole I've lived in the States for over 20 years now, but my whole family lives in Singapore, so I go back um, at least a few times a year. And then when I go back, um, I'm always just sort of listening and writing things down. Um, and in the case of SPG, um, it really was, I was researching a tiger in the kitchen, and I would spend days um, in the kitchen with my aunties and my grandmother and my mom, like cooking and making dumplings and all that stuff. And then at night, my girlfriends, my newly single girlfriends would drag me out to bars, and I would just hear all their stories and like just sort of what it was like to be a modern Singaporean woman, um, and you know, some of them jokingly calling themselves SPGs now. Um, and uh, just sort of, and I, I just sort of like started writing little snippets down. And so once I was done with Tiger, um, I realized I had inadvertently been doing research and thinking about this book uh, for a very long time before I even started it. Both of your books um, paint just this very vivid portrait of both Indian and Singaporean culture. Um, and you also critique the more negative aspects, for example, like materialism, um, through social satire. And as a result, there are some just really hilarious scenes that happen, just showing the absurdity of everything. Um, and, but one thing that both of you touch upon is the sexual harassment and the misogyny in that culture um, that women are subjected to. So can you speak on how you brought that into the book and to what extent that is fictional versus how much of it is part of the culture in actuality? Well, in mine, I think the primary thing I think that you might be referring to is I have a character who's a relatively young widow, and she's, is that largely what you're talking about, Mrs. Ray, and she's sort of developing this new lease on life and discovering what it means to be a woman who is not defined relative to a man, be that a father, a husband, a son, a brother, what happens when you are a woman who is left without any of those, who do you become, who do you identify as? But I have to say, um, within that, what was interesting to me uh, is, again, not the role of widows or women in India. It's for women in general around the world right now, a lot of policies, a lot of um, political leaders seem determined to push women back, to shove women away from the forefront and from the progress. And what's always interesting is how women navigate that within their narrower social confines. And interestingly, while I was writing this book, while I was writing Mrs. Ray, I was making the relatively conventional choice of getting engaged and then married. And within my social circle, which is a very specific urban elite in India, women now, we're not supposed to get married. We're supposed to be making a stance against what is and can be a dreadfully patriarchal and worrying institution, depending on how you choose to interpret it, but it definitely can be that. And so a lot of my friends are really pushing back against that by choosing to not get married and choosing to not have children and choosing to um, redefine their role relative to men. And I was making this sort of seemingly conventional choice in the face of all my friends. And so what's always interesting to me is how women navigate that space in their small confines, how to do something that every woman around you is not doing. And then, of course, on the larger scale, like I said, women are continuously being pushed down, and that's terrifying, and I cannot believe we even have these conversations in 2017. But the positive side of that is I truly believe that the more you 
women get pushed down, the more they find ways to break through and find their own paths that are supposedly not allowed for them. Um, I think for me in, in Singapore, um, I, you know, the misogyny is something that you witness all the time. You, you, it's, it's something you witness growing up. You know, you know it, if you're a girl, you know it from when you're four, you know, because you right away see that you have different roles than your male cousins do. Um, but I was very fortunate because I grew up in a, um, a family. My father is very, very progressive, um, and he's also very practical. Um, and he's also prides himself in, in being like the firstborn son of the firstborn son of the firstborn whatever. Um, and I'm his firstborn, so he's like, well, okay. <laughs> So he, I be, he basically raised me like a boy. He just basically let me do whatever, I, you know. He's like, yeah, you want to be a journalist? Go do, go do it, you know. Um, so I was very fortunate that way. So it, I didn't, I felt very protected from all that in some ways. But still, you can kind of see it. Because the older I got, the more I realized that no matter how much you accomplished, um, you're, even in modern Singapore, right? Singapore is so modern. You, wa you walk in and you feel like you're in London, New York in some ways. Um, but you're still very much defined by who you're married to, um, you know, whether you're a good girlfriend, a good wife, a good mother, how many children you have, what schools they're in. The women are defined by that still constantly. And so that was something that I was always very cognizant of whenever, as I got older. Um, and so I wanted to explore that a little bit in this book um, because it, it talks about women in the workplace as well and how, it, you know, how uh, harassment can happen. But, you know, sort of you have to be like sort of nice about it, you know, just to keep your job or whatever. Um, and these are things that sometimes people don't really talk about. Have you seen that um, improve at all over the past five, ten years, or is it not really evolving? The gender sexism? Yeah. Oh, I wish I could say yes. Uh, no, again, I think women are f fighting for it, and they're being more vocal, and they are finding their space, but the men are not improving. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, I... <laughs> I, you know, I haven't worked in Singapore uh, in many, many years, so I don't, I don't know what it's like to work there now. Um, but you know, I, I have to say that you know, Singapore is very. People there are very progressive-minded. You know, they're very forward-thinking. Um, you know, they're not uh, openly. Uh, you know, they don't openly put women down. But it's just like the smaller, the smaller things that are very that are ingrained in you, like the different roles you'll have at a family gathering. You know, like the the questions they'll ask you, but they won't ask your male cousins, like that kind of thing. And you know, sometimes that can be as insidious as you know someone just saying something outright to you or treating you a certain way in public. That's really true. Um, do you relate to any of your characters or their experiences? And if so, in what ways? These are really broad questions. I'm so, you're really making me think. I wish I had quicker answers. Cheryl, do you want to go first while I mull over this? Um, well, people keep asking me if they're based on my friends. And, and you know, there's some little snippets and stories here and there that are, that I, are, are things that I um, you know, heard from my friends. Um, and, you know, but I, they're not really based on um, me, I think. A lot of them are my friends' stories. There, there is one scene in the book, and it's actually one of the more uh, like horrific scenes in a way, um, that, that actually is based on it's something that I actually, it's a dinner that I went to, but I went as a professional, like a journalist, like a food journalist, and, uh, and there was this like, I don't want to give it away because it's in the back of the book, but there was this like terrible man there who's like, you know, just grabbing every woman's ass, including mine. It's like, I'm here as a journalist, but you know, it's like, it doesn't matter, you're a woman. Um, and so that was like the one scene that was like, I was like, it was, I, I wrote it exact, I remember the first draft of the book, I wrote it exact, I was so incensed by that dinner that it's really stuck with me. And when I wrote this book and I put the scene in, I wrote it exactly as it happened. Um, and I remember I, I showed it to my agent and she said, um, she said it, it, it was like so dramatic. It was like, this, it, was like, it was like the guy was just so unreal. I'm like, but it's real. And I still remember she's, uh, she said, um, you know, uh, just because it's real doesn't make it good fiction or something like that. <laughs> and uh, so we toned it down a little bit. So, you know, if you read the book and you get to that part, it's actually like much worse than it was in the book. <laughs> I still haven't found an answer, except that my main character is a 52-year-old man. So <laughs> I don't know how much I do relate to him, hopefully not too much. But worryingly, I do have many parallels to his insecurity. No, I don't actually. But I, the part of what I, I wanted to do with this book was explore writing what I don't know. And so yes, of course, I know the setting. I know these people. They are not my lived experiences. What do you hope readers most take away from your book? And who is your intended audience? 
So when I was first writing, my intended audience was my loved ones. I did not think at all that this book about this specific segment of India would be widely re- as widely received as it has been. So I was writing for my parents, my husband, my brother, people who know the same world that I do. Uh, that being said, I'm really thrilled that the global readership has evolved to a point where it is being received the way it's being received. That is so thrilling for me. Um, As far as what people take away from it, I always find there's no way to answer this without sounding so delightfully pompous and arrogant. So please, please permit me that for a minute. What I do feel, I want people to take away from it, I feel these days we're being taught to really be afraid of the outsider and the unknown and to retreat back away into our own corners. However we choose to define them, be they by race, religion, gender, caste, class, whatever you want to define it by, we're being told to sort of really self-segregate ourselves and be afraid of one another. And that's so sad and that's so frightening. And the unknown, ultimately all of our insecurities, all of our basic humanity goes so far beyond borders. Borders are so arbitrary. Nation state borders are drawn so arbitrarily and we're given those definitions by the coincidence of our birth. And I hope ultimately people see that the unknown and the foreign is possibly funnier rather than frightening. And there's really just a lot more that binds us than that pushes us away. But like I said, that sounds very arrogant. Um, I remember this really great line in your book, I'm paraphrasing here, but something about um, like, why is it that when foreigners come to our country, they're called expats, but when we go to theirs, we're called immigrants. Yeah, and I really, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't have an answer to that. That's something I really do genuinely wonder about why. And because the baggage that comes with both those terms, Mm -hmm. it's so weighted and it's so obvious and it's so arbitrary because most of the Indians, at least that I know now, my group who are living in America, are not, did not come under the traditional definition of the idea of immigrant. At the same time, my husband, who is a white New Zealander, is a music producer in Bollywood, so he's also not on one of those expat banking packages. So all the lines are so blurred, yet we stick to these words based solely on skin color, and I just don't understand it. Well, um, for me, um, well, I agree with everything you said. <laughs> um, for me, I, I've started, I've been writing about Singapore for all these years, first as a journalist in essays, et cetera, and then now in books, um, mainly because when I moved to the States over 20 years ago, um, and when I tried to explain Singapore to people, they would always name two things. They would always talk about caning, or they would talk about, like, chewing gum. Um, and so I'm like, well, you know, Singapore is much more than that. And so on my books and in all my stories, I try to show the Singapore that I know, which is very nuanced, um, you know, telling the female story is very important to me. Um, and also just, you know, sharing, like, you know, little snippets bits of the bits of Singapore that I do love, like the old neighborhoods or just the feeling of like sitting in a kopitiam, like a co- coffee shop in an old neighborhood and like, you know, propping your leg up in one chair and like, you know, having a coffee on a Saturday morning, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it's basically, yeah, in Singlish, um, I wrote this book in Singlish main, partly, mainly because Jazzy would be speaking in Singlish with her friends. So it felt like it would be wrong or, or fake if, um, if she was speaking proper Queen's English or, um, or standard English. Um, and, but I also love Singlish a lot. Um, and when I, you know, my friends call or when I go home, you know, I slip right back into it. Um, and you know, to me, you know, I love Singlish so much and I wanted to kind of write this book in Singlish and share it with everyone. Um, Cause it's a, it's a very fun, cheeky, vulgar, uh, language, which I think shows a side of Singapore and Singaporeans that people don't often see because they think we're all so boring and straight laced and we obey all the rules. I mean, we do do that. Um, you know, we don't break any rules <laughs> at all. <laughs> but, um, but um, you know, but yeah, but we're also, you know, all these other things as well. So Cheryl, you mentioned that some of your friends um, or people have asked whether any characters are based on your friends. Have any of your friends read the book and said, hey, that sounds like me? Um, it's funny, my friends, some of my friends that have some of the stories in here, they have read the book, but they never said, they never said that. So I must have taken like a, that little kernel of something and blown it up so much that they didn't recognize themselves in it, which I, which I think is very good. <laughs> what about you, Diksha? Has anyone said, um, you know, this reminds me of something that happened? I haven't gone back to India since the book came out two weeks ago. <laughs> no, but uh, one thing I did do, some of the names in the book only the names are names of actual neighbors I've had along the way in India, Um, that nothing is based on these characters. I I know this is being live streamed. I don't want to be sued by tomorrow morning. (laughs) Nothing beyond the names matches. And I was, as I was writing it sort of once, 
it was almost done, I emailed my agent panicking, saying, I think I might have to change a few of the names <laughs> because they will be identifiable. And no matter how much I tell them that I swear it has nothing to do with them, if they find out that the girl who at the time was 10 years old living across the hallway from them has suddenly written a book that just coincidentally has their name <laughs> featuring prominently, that's a good way to lose friends. <laughs> Well, I think we're going to open it up to questions from the audience, if anyone has questions. There's a hand at the back. There's a hand showing. It's a question for each of you. Are you planning to write about Asian Americans? If so, why? If not, why not? People have often asked me if I'm, when I'm going to write that Brooklyn or New York novel that so many people, you know, that because I, I've lived here for so long. But I always tell them that I can write about Singapore um, so freely, not, not freely, but um, so I, passionately or, 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 or the way that I do because I live so far away. Um, you know, I, when I'm in Singapore, I'm like pressed up against everything and just absorbing everything by osmosis. But then when I'm here is when I can step back and I can see the whole elephant, not just the knee. Um, so I always tell people that if I ever move to Singapore, that's when I'll be writing the New York or Asian American story. <laughs> Uh, and I don't know, I think myself I identify as a bit as a third culture person in that I identify both as Indian and as American, not necessarily as the definition of Indian American. And a lot of my young characters are similarly third culture global characters. Don't be shy. There's oh, another hand yeah. back there. Uh, Mr. Jaw was my favorite character in The Windfall because, like, as someone who's grown up visiting Delhi, it's so nice. To, or it's just funny to be able to relate to how many insecure people you come across. Um, was it difficult keeping Mrs. Jaw so simple and grounded and humble compared to her husband who's coming to new money? I, I mean, every part of the writing process was difficult, but, uh, but Mrs. Jha sort of ends up being my hero, and I'm sure that's evident through the book. And like I said, there's something about, you know, we talked about male gender dynamics earlier. There's something about this sort of sad male bravado, which is where a lot of the humor lies. And that is entirely the realm of men. And I find that just so much fun to play with that Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Cha, his wife, inevitably became the voice of reason in contrast to him. The, the microphone's coming to you behind you. Well, I, ha I haven't read your book, but it sounds like um, it's similar in the sense that both of you are, are mocking and criticizing uh, your cultures. And I wonder if you've gotten any pushback on that account. I'm going to wait for you to ask me that again after you read it, because I don't think a single part of me is mocking or um, degrading any part of not just my culture, but even new money, because I really do feel such a great fondness for all my characters. And that seems to be fortunately what all the Indian critics so far have also picked up on. So I have not received any pushback, but that's an interesting question. If, and I would hope that that is not the vibe that this panel is giving. And if it is, I would really like to hear back from you after you no, read no, the book. No, no, I don't, perhaps mocking was the um, wrong word, but they're satirical books, right? I, I, I don't it's even know if I would use that word. On the uh, no, I know, I agree that it is, but I don't even know if I, if I would necessarily use that term. But um, for me, it was quite, uh, quite believable, but I'm happy to have someone else step in and answer that, or Cheryl take it. Well, maybe I'll just address it to Cheryl, because I've read her book. And, and you do, that your book is critical in some respects. It's also very loving, but it's critical in some respects of Singaporean uh, paternalism, for example. And I just wonder, have you uh, received any pushback on that? Um, well, you know, it's not, um, you know, the, the book isn't a, a harsh, uh, it's harsh in some ways on, on I think, uh, uh, the men in the book, uh, you know, someone said, God, you know, they all sound awful. Um, but, um, but, um, but it's not really a critique of the country and, and culture in general, so to speak, just sort of certain pockets. Um, but, um, but in some, but when the book came out, um, there were some people who were like, why, why? Well, the first big critic was my dad um, because he read it. And, you know, my dad was, you know, one of those, like, he was, his was the generation that they spoke English. And so we always spoke proper English at home. So when he read this, he, like, summoned me to lunch the next day. And he was like, who taught you to speak like this? And, like, <laughs> 
And so the Singlish was actually something that some people liked, but some people were like, why are you showing this side of Singapore that we don't, you know, we don't, you know, it's, it's like a, this guttural English kind of thing. Um, you know, because the Singapore government has had this speak good English campaign that they spend millions of dollars on. Um, and uh, so they, come, they want Singaporeans to speak proper English, um, which, you know, I, I, I recognize that. And, you know, this book is not saying Singaporeans shouldn't speak proper English. Um, so there was that. There was a Singlish part of it. And then there was also just writing about SPGs in general because, you know, there was um, th when I w when the book came out last year, I was interviewed by the Straits Times, um, and uh, the reporter sat me down, and he was this young man, uh, and I could tell he didn't like the book very much. And uh, his first one of his first questions was, "What made you decide to write about uh, a woman who's such a bad example for Singaporeans?" <laughs> and I was like, "Well, aren't those like the best?" characters to write about because they're flawed and they're interesting to explore and hopefully they go on some journey and they do learn something and change. <laughs> um, but that didn't fly so well. <laughs> Hi, first of all, it's, this is my first time here and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. So thank you everyone for that. Um, question I have for you, Mills. Uh, I haven't read your book, but after this talk, I'll definitely go back and read the book. Good. I'm sure uh, every single character, some way or the other, I'll have a story related to that. I'm not one of the Jars or the Chopras, but I know I would know somebody <laughs> who has part of it. The question I have for you is, I think one of the questions was asked, like, who did you, read the, who did you write this book for? Or, and the answer you gave struck me. And I'm not trying to pick on you, but it's just I'm much older than you, so I have a different, different aspect to that. Uh, you mentioned for my dad, my, my, for my husband, for my brothers. So if I look at the gender, it's all male. I said my parents. OK. All right. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I was just trying to figure out, like, why, why is it now going? Because I love the comment that is made on expat and borders. And you know, these are the kind of thought process that we have seen going through the younger generation. I have kids who were born here and being brought up here, and they have a completely different outlook, how we look at the society and the culture and the immigration. So it's great, but I was just curious to know. But I think uh, I said parents, point. and if I had a sister, it would be as much for her. If I had a wife, it would be as much for her. OK, great. Thank you, and good luck. <laughs> Ah, this is a question for Cheryl as a fellow Singaporean. Um, I'm also I'm familiar in with now. Yeah, <laughs> hi. Yeah. Uh, I'm familiar with Kevin Kwan's uh, Crazy Rich Asians. So my question is, when is your book going to be a movie? <laughs> um, there are some things happening, but we're not talking about it just yet. Um, so, but, um, but, you know, I feel like, you know, Hollywood, you never quite know when anything is going to happen. Um, but, you know, uh, when I can say something, I'll post it on Facebook, on Twitter. <laughs> Hi, thank you both so much. Um, you mentioned briefly that the process was uh, difficult, but you, you both speak with so much confidence and eloquence. So I was just curious if you could talk a little bit more about the process. And uh, you also mentioned how you didn't have to research much. So I'm just curious. If it was a, it was very easy. If it just the words sort of flowed out, or you met snags along the way, and I guess sort of what you learned in the, the process or the journey of the process. Yeah, yes, it was not easy. Um, I always put my agent on the spot for this, and he's sitting right here. So afterwards, if you want to ask him more cross questions, he's in the third row. <laughs> Um, mine started off as a collection of short stories in my MFA program because obviously short stories are much easier to workshop, they're much more contained, and so it began as a collection of interconnected short stories which was loosely based around Mr. and Mrs. Cha, my primary couple, and the fact that they do come into a large sum of money, but then it was written much more episodically, and it was that was my thesis, and that was what I went to my agent with, and then I worked with him for about two years to do massive edits. I mean, I'm talking about deleting 60,000 words and writing new 60,000 words words, deleting whole characters, whole settings, whole scenes. And so it was a very slow process. Um, and it, I mean, writing is so deeply isolating and so potentially depressing, and it was all of the above. <laughs> and I'm very glad that um, my spoken persona does not reveal that, because that would make me a very depressing person. <laughs> 
Um, this book was uh, both a joy and a pain to write because uh, pain because writing sometimes just feels like oh my god is it ever going to happen um, are the words actually going to come out I have these thoughts in my head um, but when I did when they were actually going I, I always I always I have several writer friends and some of them are like a thousand words a day or two thousand words a day or whatever um, and I've never really I've tried to do that sometimes I'm trying to do that now but um, but I've never quite been that person I always um, sort of liken my writing process to having to go to the bathroom. It's like, you, <laughs> you have to wait until you really have to pee, then you go. Um, and then, so for me, it's a lot of sort of sitting around and thinking and having things percolate. Um, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, it's time, let's go. And then like, you know, I cancel all my plans for like a week and I lock myself in a room. And then, you know, like the, the last, um, the first draft of this book, and obviously we went through several, a few, re several revisions, but, uh, the last 30,000 words I wrote in this like fevered like three weeks, um, which I've, I, I wish I could like write at that pace all the time because I would be writing a book every three months. Um, but um, but yeah, no, so it's it's for me that it was when you're in the zone, like that's when it's really joyous. It's like, you know, and for me writing in this English was a lot of fun too, um, you know, because I, I felt like it was just all coming out. I felt like at some points I was just sort of like channeling, like Jazzy was in my head and like sitting there and she's going like, type faster la, you, you know, and I'm just trying to like move as fast as I can. Um, so um, so yeah, when that, when that happened was joyous, but when I'm kind of sitting around waiting for lightning to strike, it wasn't so joyous. Hello, thank you both for every, all your comments so far. Um, my question I had it was about names, and I'll admit I've only read uh, Miss uh, Basu's book. I'm gonna read both uh, now, but um, I noticed in the book, without giving anything away, there's a moment that uh, struck me where one character assumes that another uh, character who is Indian is white based on their name and is really surprised uh, when they meet them. They're like, oh my gosh, like she's an Indian woman, but just with a really weird name. And I know um, also in, uh, from my uh, uh, Asian friends, my Chinese friends, and. Uh, whatnot. Uh, they um, have told me about how when they were younger they would get their American names and they would sometimes use them when they come over here. And I don't know if that was something that was uh, thought about when writing your books, if there was a very conscious choice to give some uh, characters names to show sort of link to I don't know, Americanism or uh, whiteness or something about that, if that makes sense. Most of my name is actually quite just traditionally Indian. Uh, I will just call you out, Jack, right? The, the my young man who just asked the question is one of my former students and one of the most talented writers I've come across. And so you will be seeing his work in the near future, I hope. Um, that being said, no, my names were all quite rooted in India and just sort of average Indian names. I didn't play around too much other than the one instance you mentioned with any kind of racial ambiguity. It came up for me a lot more recently while naming my, ha my Chanel baby daughter. <laughs> Um, in Singapore, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, Singaporeans, regardless of race, uh, tend to have uh, Christian names or Anglo names. Um, uh, not all, but a lot do. So even my Indian and Malay friends, like my, my I mentioned my friend Dahlia before, she's Malay. Um, you know, and 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 you know, I, my my best Indian Singaporean friends are Joanne and Annabelle. Um, you know, and it's so we grew up with that. But um, in the case of this book, so in 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 SPG, a lot of people have Anglo names, but not all. Um, but in the case of Jazzy, um, Jazzy is actually um, of a family that's very, very traditional and wouldn't, wouldn't have given her an Anglo name. And so she names herself. And so that's part of, that's part of uh, pinning down her identity as well. Because she decides to create herself by creating, giving herself a name. And she calls herself Jazzelyn because she's like, you know, she's like, nobody else in Singapore has this name. I'm special. And she like makes it up herself. So, um, so there, there is some of that. So in that, in that, in that way, like, her name itself was important in sort of crafting her own identity, both for herself and also in the narrative. There's one right up front. And I basically want you to elaborate more on that because um, like in discipline wise, it gets bifurcated into Asian American literature and Asian literature. And personally, in my experience, my reading experience has been bifurcated as well. I don't identify with Korean American literature. I often are very critical of how they represent the home country's culture. Yet when I read Korean literature, I find myself having kind of this anthropological distance to the representation of my own country. Um, 
Well, I guess one way, one way to answer that is I was, one, was curious if you have a community of literary influences, authors, who you think inhabit that third culture position. Is there a community of such authors? <laughs> yeah. Well, the most recent one, of course, who I think has been here is Karan Mahajan, whose book came out last year, The Association of Small Bombs. Um, but I, I, I think that's a really good question that you ask, and that's something that I definitely struggle to navigate because I think you said it perfectly. Uh, I hope you're writing because I said I think you are exactly what you said is what I would have said back, which is that you don't necessarily identify as Asian American, which I don't, and I also don't identify as fully Indian, I don't identify as fully American, yet I have the luxury of sort of identifying as all of them, and I don't see that as a burden at all, I see that as a privilege. And I think going forward that community is forming, and I hope it is, and I seem to, it seems to be forming. Uh, the Jaipur Literature Festival that happens in India every January sort of seems to bring together uh, more and more people like this. Uh, but I think we are moving as readers and writers past the immigrant novel, past the diaspora novel, and we're moving into a space where there are more and more voices like mine or like Karan's. I agree. Um, I was thinking about that too when I read um, Exit West recently, which is my favorite book of this year. Um, and it, I just like how these stories have moved beyond sort of what the narrative was even five, ten years ago. Um, and I mean, for me personally, you know, I actually, um, I'm not American, I'm still Singaporean. Um, and I, even though I've lived here more years than I lived in Singapore, and I, the longer I live here, um, the more Singaporean I feel. Um, so I actually don't know if I'll ever get around to writing that Asian American novel because I don't, I, you know, I, I, I live here, I'm Asian, and I'm sort of Americanized, but the longer I'm here, the more Singaporean I feel. I think we have time for one more question. So one thing that sticks out when both of you are reading is that you're both hilarious. Like both of those readings were really funny. And I think it also relates to what you were saying earlier about like sort of navigating patriarchy. Like, you know, you have to be very inventive and ingenious actually. And even if, you know, the way it's coming out can be mocked for being feminized or silly or something, it's still, there's like play there. And I appreciated that a lot about both of your books. And I was wondering also just like kind of a craft question, like what does it feel like to write something funny? Or do you know when you're writing something that it's funny? Or like how does it, how does that come out? Can you like hear it and then write it down? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't intentionally write funny. It just, uh, jazzy just sort of came into my head. Like I know it's, it's, I, I, it sounds so, but it, I was struggling with this topic and trying to figure out how to, uh, to, to sort of navigate it. And then her voice literally like, popped in my head one day. And I, you know, I wrote like the first, you know, spurt in like two days. Um, and, you know, so it, for me, it wasn't sort of, she's funny. I don't know where she came from, but suddenly she just popped up and I was just sort of, you know, telling her story. Um, but, you know, I think that humor can be a very uh, essential and powerful way to tell a story. Um, and because if you have so much bleakness and like awfulness, it's like you're going to, you know, it's not a, it's, 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 that's a, I don't know, that's a very bleak story to tell. Um, and, you know, not to say those aren't, you know, important to tell, but, um, but in the case of this, like what I wanted to explore was also sort of uh, normalizing and the idea of, of, of being in a situation and feeling like, which is something we've, we've been talking about a lot in the States in the last several months, but just sort of being in the situation where it's changing and all of a sudden you're feeling like this situation that is getting more normalized, that it's actually not normal. Um, and so I wanted to explore all of that, but do that through sort of a, a lens of, a slight lens of humor. Yeah, I think humor is so deeply satisfying. I think my book does take on topics such as the patriarchy or class warfare, which can be quite violent. And to do that without humor would be so dreadfully boring um, and so earnest. And uh, other people can do it well, I'm sure. I, I can't. That's not what I, I gravitate towards. I gravitate towards doing it with a bit of humor because also without it, it would all just be so depressing. Every day would be so depressing, um, especially the way the world is going right now. Well, thanks for all your questions, and thanks for coming to this. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you're all now convinced to read both of their books, which are on sale in the back.